We're going to move on to the next thing that mom has planned, which is going to start with a video done by my youngest sister, who couldn't be here today. And then there'll be an opportunity for anybody who'd like to share to, to do that. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry I couldn't be there today. And um, worked long and hard at putting off this video <laughs> that mom asked me to do, for obvious reasons I'm sure you can figure out. But finally, after lots of memories and um, tears and laughing and all of the things, this is what I came up with. So mom, I hope you like it. This is the top 10 reasons my dad was better than your dad. So number 10, education. And that's the reason that we're not there in person today. You know, many of you were asked by dad at some point or another if you were the smartest kid in class. He was always asking us that as we went through school. And one of those smartest kids is graduating today. So that's why we're not over there with you. Um, I will never forget when that kiddo called mom and dad to tell them about getting into a very competitive Running Start program and dad got really choked up over it. He was so proud of that kiddo and so am I. I know he would have loved to have been there today with us. Number nine, practical skills. So I don't know what your dad taught you, but my dad taught me some things that no other girls my age knew when I went off to college. They were sending me with a really old car and dad made sure that I knew how to check the oil and change a tire and even um, use my hand to cover the intake manifold so that the car would actually start while somebody else was starting it. So it made me look pretty tough for in my first year of college but and definitely came in handy for me. Uh, number nine, kitchen confidence, or sorry, number eight. Um, so most of you know dad didn't have a humongous kitchen repertoire. He was great at waffles. He add, would have added peanut butter to anything. Um, so his limited skills in the kitchen made us really surprised one day when he seemed very, very confident. One of my siblings went to make a cake and the recipe called for separated eggs. And they had no idea what does that mean, separated eggs. And dad was pretty incredulous. He's like, what do you mean? You don't know how to separate eggs? And I remember mom and I kind of looked at each other and we're like, uh, and you do? Of course I do. So he goes in the kitchen and he took an egg and he cracked it and tossed it in the bowl of everything else. And he said, there, it's separated. <laughs> it was a pretty good laugh for mom and me that day. And then we had to tell him what separating eggs really meant. Um, number seven, undershirts. Dad was of the undershirt era. He always had an undershirt on whatever other shirt he was wearing in his whole life. And for me, when I was little and we would go on walks and I would get chilly, that meant he would literally give the shirt off of his back so that I would be warm and he still had a shirt on too. We all know that that was him figuratively in other ways than what he gave to us through the years, but he always gave me his actual shirt too. Number six, willing to experiment. So. Dad's famous for the stories that he told us about the crazy things that would go on when he was growing up. And I remember um, it was probably fifth or sixth grade living in Richland and we did not have an ice rink and so there was no place to go ice skating unless we drove all the way to Walla Walla. So one year dad decided he would try to flood the backyard with the garden hose and see if he could make um, an ice rink for me. <laughs> I remember thinking it was totally nuts, but totally awesome. Unfortunately, it didn't work. There were all kinds of bumps from the grass sticking up through everything, and he used an awful lot of water because it was an awfully big yard. So that was pretty cool that he would be willing to do that. Um, number five, hobbies. So I'm, I feel super grateful for the hobbies Dad shared with me and, and love to share them now. The, you know, he was a huge reader, which I got from him, and it, it reading so, I don't know, it's just, it's a great way to pass the time. It's something I have really loved. I learned so much, it expands my world. And the other thing is um, photography. You know, he loved doing all kinds of photography, and so do I. I love being, being able to take pictures of the people I love and things of nature. One of the things he taught me with that is learning to look, really look around you and see um, some of the beautiful and amazing things that a lot of people miss when you're not really looking. So number four, vintage songs. Everybody is <laughs> familiar with some of Dad's vintage songs and I'm sure could belt out several of them right now. Um, that was 
really funny to have that in my head one day many years ago in the ICU when I had a patient coming out of the OR and they were still, you know, coming out of anesthesia and I, as they came around the corner into the OR being pushed on the gurney, I could hear this person singing at the top of his lungs the cigarettes and whiskey song and I joined in. I just started singing with them as they rolled into the door and this person's eyes opened up, <laughs> kind of looked at me and all of my peers that were there at the time looked at me like, what in the world is that and why do you know those words? That was pretty funny and, uh, you know, that was dad. Um, number three, he always made sure that I knew, just like all of us, he always made sure that we knew how much he loved us and things he saw. He always saw potential and celebrated potential and could look past shortcomings or bad days. Um, one of the times that sticks out for me the most is in my senior year of high school when he was in California and mom and I were on our own up in Tri-City still and Mother's Day came around and of course he sent flowers to, dad, uh, to mom but he also sent flowers to me and a really nice note saying that he knew that one day I would make a wonderful mother and he wanted me to know that and sent those flowers so that I wasn't left out and that he saw that in my future and that was really special. Number two, make a moo. That's one of my favorites. That man could make a moo. And I think part of the most fun was not only that he was good at it, but that he would oblige every time we were somewhere, anywhere, and said, hey, Dad, make a moo. Even in restaurants when Mom would be muttering, you better not. And he always obliged and did it anyways. And we just all were always laughing with Dad, and especially things like that. Um, Karen came with us one time. We went to Disney World, and Dad and Mom were in one of the car things, and we were behind at the Haunted House ride, and in the middle of the dark, <laughs> all of a sudden we hear mooing and just cracked up. And when we got off the ride at the end, Dad was saying, well, you know, I just didn't want my girls to be scared in the dark. I wanted them to know their dad was right there. Totally a dad thing. So my number one reason for why my dad was better than your dad is that it's, in fact, never too late. So one of the things he told me actually in the car on the way to college all those years ago was that no matter what I was doing, um, it was never too late to change my mind or to start over or to rethink. I was never too old, it was never too late, and I shouldn't be afraid to do that. That advice has served me really well throughout my nursing career and let me follow different paths and specialize in different things when it was right for me or my family. And is the reason that at the age I am, um, I'm going back to grad school this fall at the University of Washington Bothell to get my master's in nursing. And I know he would be really proud of me for doing that. So again, I wish we could be there with you, but I know we're in the right spot today. And I wish I could hug you all, but I know you're having a great time celebrating dad. Bye. Okay, since I'm holding the mic, <clears throat> I get to go next, um, which is probably a good thing because much longer and I'm not sure I could get through this. Um, so my, my dad was um, never afraid to speak his mind. And one of the best illustrations, best stories of that is 50 years ago, he was invited to a, a meeting of the Richland Rotary Club. The speaker that day was talking about teenagers. Now, at the time, he had four of them in his house. Um, and the speaker basically said, they're no good. That was, the, that was the substance of his message. So at the end, when he was taking questions, Dad got up, and he said, I'm a guest here, and I may never be invited back, but I think you're full of crap. <laughs> the, the, the police burst into applause. <laughs> The, the speaker went and sat down. They invited him to join. <laughs> he, he was also um, incredibly wise. Uh, being the oldest, that meant that uh, we were regularly plowing new ground. You know, there was something I wanted to do that 
we'd not done before. So instead of responding out of fear, which would cause you to say no, his initial response was always, I'm not emotionally prepared. <laughs> now, what that meant was, if you press me for an answer now, it will likely be no. If you give me a little bit of opportunity to, to kind of get used to the idea, the, the answer may very well be different. It, it was, it was a, a really clear indication of his understanding of his own weakness, you know, that, that fear would cause you to respond in a way that maybe if you had a little time, you wouldn't, but it, uh, you know, it was something that a number of us heard a, a fair number of times. I'm not emotionally prepared. The, uh, the other thing that, uh, you know, re recently I, I was given a fairly substantial award, and this is not about me, uh, but I get asked by people, why have you been involved in these various things in the community that have led to this? And my answer was always, because it was the right thing to do, which was absolutely something that I got from him. It was the right thing to do. So we'd, we'd love to have anybody else who's interested share. Um, we're, uh, we're making a video that mom can have later, so it would be ideal if you can come up here, but if not, we'll bring the mic to you. All right, we got somebody coming. Okay, I'm not gonna go through all these albums. I'm actually gonna let you guys pass the albums around. Um, and so I'm just gonna hand them here to Allison and she can go ahead and give one to different tables if she wants. But anyway, um, like Mark, I need to be one of the first because I need to be able to get through this. And I put mine on paper because hopefully on paper I'll be able to read it and get through to you guys. So, and like my sister Lynn, um, mine has a theme. So this is my dad, and it's big shoes to fill. There's so much that can be said about my dad, yet we will leave here with many things unsaid. The same is true about those right here with us today. Life is short, and we need to make the most of it. My dad and mom showed love to each other every day, and their love was, for us was, was and is always present. Don't put off telling people how important they are to you. Don't put off telling someone how a simple gesture on their part made you feel. I was raised in a family of huggers, and any of you know, who know me know that I love to hug and be hugged. Dad was one of the best huggers. Take a moment right now and hug someone you love. Okay, so I mentioned that I brought a few albums to share. Um, one of the albums, the Big Black album, that's an album that Mom and I put together. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> one of my precious grandchildren. <laughs> Thank you, Paisley. So the Black album, that one is one. Mom and I worked for about a year on a surprise 80th birthday party for Dad. It came off without a hitch. The way that we got him to the venue, he thought that our dear friends, the Colados, were, thank you, <laughs> that they were having a celebration and he was going to their celebration. So he walked in the door saying, this is supposed to be a party for the Colados. <laughs> anyway, after that party, mom and I spent quite a long time putting together this album and then she surprised him with that on his 81st birthday. Um, so, the party was a great success. There are photos and comments in there that are just a fun trip down memory lane. Um, and I just, uh, mom had given that album to me recently and I thought that album should be here because people should be able to see things that people wrote about dad and just some of the fun pictures that are in that album. 
The second album doesn't have as many photos. It's the large yellow one. But it's an album I've started that I call My Dad. I don't have many photos of my dad from when he was growing up, but the front of the album is a photo of him and his, with his three brothers before the last two children were born. So sorry, Aunt Judy and Uncle Chris, that you're not in that photo. <laughs> uh, but you were just a thought at the time. Um, dad met the love of his life, and their wedding photo is in that album. Dad was so much fun. He could certainly crown clown around with the best of them. Be sure to look at the funny photos at the end. One of them you might have already noticed in the slideshow. It's not my photo. It's my sister Karen's photo. One of my favorite photos of my dad hanging on for dear life on the tail of an orca. <laughs> uh, the third album I call my grandpa. It starts with my theme, big shoes to fill. Dad was known to wear Converse te tennis shoes. Look around, some of the grandchildren are wearing Converse today in honor of Dad, their grandpa. As little ones, we loved wearing grandpa's shoes, or they loved wearing grandpa's shoes, big shoes to fill. I could have filled an entire album of grandpa reading to his children and great-grandchildren. I still remember him reading to my siblings and me each evening before bedtime. There are some tender photos and silly photos. We had more than one granddaughter try to share her hair with him. <laughs> you won't see a photo, but at one time he even had a ball cap where he had attached the ponytail from one granddaughter and the pigtail from another granddaughter, and he put that ball cap on and he had hair. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there are many other things you won't see in the photo. Photos. Dad kneeling at our bedside for nighttime prayers before he tucked us into bed our family baseball games after dinner on warm summer evenings in Southern California. We were all on the field, no photographer. One-on-one -on -one talks with teens before our first dates. The respect dad commanded and gave to all of us. With just the snap of his fingers, he could get all six, then seven, then eight of us silent in the pew at church. <laughs> If we were whispering or inattentive, that snap of the fingers, and that was it. We all knew what it meant. His sacrifices and generosity also aren't seen in the photos. He was a selfless man who worked hard and made sure his children had shoes that fit and tummies that were full. And if you didn't get your tummies full here, it's your own fault. <laughs> Dad never knew a child he didn't like, and they all liked him. Whether it was at church, in a restaurant, or in our home, when friends would come over, the children were drawn to Dad's affection for them. There have been seven great-grandchildren born since Dad left us, and there will be many more. There is no doubt in my mind that all his great-grandchildren will know him because of the love he showed their parents. His love will live on through them. Brian once wrote a letter to me, which included a paragraph about my dad. Here is part of what Brian said, quote, he's an exceptional man with a big heart. I am not even remotely comparable to your dad. Never have been, never will be. He's a rare breed, and you are extremely lucky to have him for a father. I couldn't have said it better. He's an exceptional man with a big heart. He's a rare breed, and you are extremely lucky to have him for a father big shoes to fill. Okay, let's talk numbers. Though some are unable to be here with us for various reasons, there are 123 of us. Dad and mom have eight children and our spouses, 58 grandchildren, including the spouses of the grandchildren, and 48 great-grandchildren. Big shoes to fill. Counting all the anniversaries of all of, of mom and dad, their wonderful 66 years, and all the children and grandchildren who are married, anniversaries through the end of 2022, we share 578 years of marriage. Big shoes to fill. After we celebrated dad and mom's 50th wedding anniversary, dad wrote us a note. In part, it said, 
Quote, I've told mom our marriage is half over, so we look forward to a 100th anniversary party. Start thinking about it, unquote. <laughs> I'm sorry we didn't get to plan that 100th anniversary party, but dad and mom shared 66 years of marriage, and we got to celebrate dad's 90th birthday with him in February 2020 before everything shut down. My siblings and I assured dad before his passing that we would take good care of mom. We all try to be present in our own ways. We try to do things we know dad would have done. We will continue to do what we can for mom, but we will never be able to replace dad. Shoes too big to fill. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you for coming and for letting me say just a small bit of what, it is, what is in my heart. Hug each other. Tell people what they mean to you, and if you are so inclined, share a hug with me. I love you, Dad, and though it is not at all the same, today I will give Mom extra hugs for you. Shoes too big to fill. Who, who else? Everyone here in this room knows what a great man my father was. Everyone that Dad's life touched, they all love him very much. I grew up in a wonderful family. My father was a great provider, and my mom kept everything running smoothly. I have so many wonderful memories. Uh, when we moved to Washington, Dad provided everything we could ever imagined to enjoy our new environment. Ski equipment for, for snow skiing, for water skiing. He bought the boat. Uh, and he invited my Uncle Bob up to teach us all how to water ski. Now, Dad had never pulled a skier, and my Uncle Bob was going to go first. And my Uncle Bob, uh, as far as Dad had ever seen, he'd just see people in the water with two skis on, and they'd pop up on the water. Well, my Uncle Bob was a good skier. He was going to step start right off the beach. He took a few lengths of rope, and he said, when I tell you to hit it, you just go. So he yells, hit it. Dad hits it. But then he turns around to look, and he sees all this loose rope, and he thinks he's done something wrong. So as soon as the rope goes taut, Dad's already backing off on the throttle. And Bob didn't want to get wet. And Dad just sunk him up to his eyeballs. <laughs> then he, he's yelling, hit it, hit it. So he pops him up, and he popped out, and he started skiing. The, probably one of the proudest moments I ever had, I was uh, 14 or 15 years old. I got a job as a busboy at the Hanford House. And they were giving me my orientation. And we went through the kitchen, and there was eight, eight by 10 glossies of important businessmen in the community. They told us we needed to memorize all those faces. And if they ever came in, they should get the very best service. Well, as I scanned the pictures, I noticed, wow, I can recognize that guy any day. He's my dad. And uh, it was just a, a wonderful experience living with him. You know, I was lucky to have him for 64 years of my life. And in all that time, he only lied to me one time. He said he's going to live to be 126. Well, we all know he didn't make that. But I'm so proud of that man. I miss him so much. Anyway, thank you all for coming. You know, we never, we never know when it's our time. So all of you, mom, my aunts and uncles, my brothers and sisters, my nieces and nephews, my grandnieces and nephews, my cousins, you're all very important to me. I love you all. All very much. Who else? I'm only going to take a minute, but I just had to get up. Listening to you 
all and feeling the spirit of Shirley and Jean. I can't stand it. Um, I'm Kirsten Williams, and that's my husband, and we are next door neighbors. We live right next door to Jean and Shirley, and we only had the privilege of getting to know Jean for two years. But let me tell you, it was such an incredible experience. This man was so happy. I mean, we were so impressed with him. He was so happy, and yes, and he was very forthright. And I can remember, I, re I retired as a registered nurse, and so I told them, I said, um, you know, if you ever need any help, um, we'd be happy to help, come over and talk. Never once did they ask for any help. And we figured out why. Because they had all of you. <laughs> they had all these children and family that were always there to help them. And we were just so impressed. And so even though you don't know us, we feel like we know you because we have heard the stories from Gene. And because we see the reflection of his light coming from all of you, and we're so grateful to have had that. And we want to remind you also that um, sorrow is the greatest reflection of love. So grief and sorrow is the most perfect reflection of love. And so the only way to take sorrow out of death would be to take love out of life. And how can you imagine? taking that out of, your, there's impossible, it would be impossible with Gene. And I will just tell you one quick story when we first met him, talk about forthright. We just live next door to the Mormon temple and so we just happened to start to say something about that. I don't even remember what it was, but we were not trying to convert them to the church. I want you to know that. <laughs> we are Mormons. And Gene stood right up and he said, I just want you to know right now that we don't want to hear anything about your Mormon church. You don't tell us anything about the Mormons, and we won't tell you anything about the Catholics, and we'll get along just fine. <laughs> and I was like, all right. So we never talked religion. But I'll tell you what, we do know. Gene loves God. He loves Shirley. And he loves his children. And there was just no buts about that. Thank you. Who else? I might have to call on somebody. <laughs> Talk about shoes to fill. I'm uh, really very lucky to be wearing some of Grandpa's shoes that uh, uh, Grandma gave me that were brand new in the box and uh, took them out of the box this morning for the first time and just those are his shoes i mean they are um but i think about uh you know as uh, if you go back through uh the tables and the pictures back there there's there's a book and i remember this book uh that he made um uh, many years ago for kevin that is uh captain kevin and the and the fierce pirates or something like that and kevin was fascinated with pirate stories and so what did Grandpa do? He <laughs> researched and wrote a whole book, a whole story on pirates. And there's a whole thing back there that, that he and Grandma put together. And the thing that just struck me, you know, there's a note in the beginning of it. And, and it, in it, he says, you know, I, I know that, Kevin, I know you're, you really like pirates, but, you know, pirates weren't really very good people. A lot of them were very vicious and greedy and evil men and they did a lot of terrible things but i know that that's not like captain kevin and captain kevin is a really great kid and he's going to grow up to be a fine man and that is something that i just you know i every time that i <laughs> every time that uh you know when i was a kid any, any time that i ever got in trouble, uh, the thing that I remember, the um, thing I remember my dad always saying to me, um, you know, it'd be, I'd uh, have done, done something and get in all, all, kind, all kinds of trouble and, and have some conversation and, and uh, my dad would say, uh, you know, you're a great kid and I love you very much. And I always thought that that was a really special thing. One time, uh, Grandma and Grandpa uh, stayed with us when my folks were out of town, 
and um, as could be expected, <laughs> I got in trouble. <laughs> and I heard the same thing from Grandpa at the end of, you know, <laughs> at the end of the very stern talking to that had me quite intimidated and in tears. And uh, he, he was like, you know, you're a great kid and I love you very much. And that is Grandpa, and I see it in just the love that he had for all of us, the sense of belief in every person, um, and the love that he had for them, and that it didn't matter who you were, that he loved you very much, and he knew the potential that you had in you. And I'm just so grateful for that legacy and um, just the just the incredible person that he was and the way that he saw the us in his family, the way that he interacted with people, and just the depth of love and care and belief that he had. Just absolutely incredible, incredible man. Who else? Hi, I'm Rose Collado, and my husband Doris there. One of the things that, um, well, I've known the uh, Brout families for quite a number of years, starting with Sue and the children that, our children were in the same uh, age group, and they became very good friends, There's Carrie Lynn out there, and all the others. But one of the things that Dora and I do is that we do marriage preparation for the Catholic Church, and we have been doing marriage preparation for about 41 years. And um, one of the things that we have presented on the Engaging Kind of Weekends is that we try to bring into our, um, our talks um, people that really have an effect on our lives. And one of those that we bring out is Jean and Shirley. They are the um, perfect example of a married couple that love each other so deeply, and I mean, just the way that I treat, they treat each other and how they treat us. Every time that we've seen Gene, he's always asked, how is your family? How is everything? And he just has a great um, uh, care for our families. And um, I think that is one of the beautiful things about Gene and Shirley is that we lift them up on the weekends to say this is a couple that is one that really put a, um, amplifies the beauty of a beautiful marriage. And marriage is the, is the basic of a family, and we've seen that in all the, um, the children that have been, um, that are part of the broad families. I mean, they all have a significant uh, character about you guys that you, I mean, it's, it's Jean and Brawl, uh, Jean and Shirley. And every time I look at you, I said, oh, I can kind of pick you out who the Brawl families are. But um, I, I think that, I think for, for us, it has always been um, one couple that we kind of always lift up uh, on our engaging kind of weekend to say, this is a couple that really exemplifies what a perfect marriage is the beauty and the love and the growth of your family that, um, that makes our married life so much easier, so much um, something that we can look up and uh, live toward. And so I just wanted to share that. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? So I'm not going to take too long, but uh, I know my sister Amy couldn't be here today, so I'd like to tell a funny story <laughs> about uh, an experience she had with Grandpa. We all knew him, well, my brother and myself and Amy knew him as the wrestling grandpa because we were too young to differentiate the size of the families. Um, we all know that he was a great man of character and that we loved him very much, and 
uh, I would just be repeating a lot of what other people said. So one time, it was myself, my sister, and Kevin. We were all wrestling grump in the living room. <laughs> and uh, we were get about getting to the age where it was a challenge for him with all three of us. And a Amy uh, decided she would take it up a notch and took off his sock. And then while my brother and I tried to wrestle him, uh, his mouth was open, and she took his sock, and she stuffed it in his mouth. So I don't know who, who's already heard that story or not, but it is a true story, and um, uh, yeah, he did not like that, so <laughs> there was a stern talking to, but, um, but yeah, we loved him very much, and we all miss him. Anybody else? I see somebody coming. Taking the long way around. So I'm Kathy Brault, and um, Mark and I met when I was still in high school. And sometime after that, um, yeah, just a few weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, sometime after that, he, um, we'd been dating for a while, and he invited me to have dinner with his family. So I go into this family, and I wasn't particularly like impressed by the size of the family. It was a little bigger than mine. We came from five. I was the oldest of five. He was the oldest of eight. But what was different was the whole feeling in the table. Because in my family, it was kind of like a little bit of, well, it's free for all. <laughs> I mean, we had fun, but, you know, but this, I mean, everybody here was like, they had their table manners figured out, and they were just like, I was like, wow. So I'm getting a little intimidated because everything was just so smooth. Of course, that was because of mom, and it was her style. She always has everything figured out, and I appreciate that and learned so much from her over the years. But um, anyway, so I'm kind of a little nervous, and I said something to Mark very quietly, and Dad... I knew someday I'd be able to tell on you, but everybody's probably heard this story anyway. Um, he said to me, we don't tell secrets at the table. <laughs> now, I'm 18 years old, going to dinner the first time with my boyfriend, and I am like, oh my goodness, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> so later I learned that he was probably teasing me, but sometimes it's hard to tell, right? Anyway. Um, over the years, I, um, I learned to respect my second dad so much, so very much. One of the biggest joys in my life has been um, having the chance to have them over for dinner. We've had them over for dinner for years, for Monday nights. And then we invited my parents, too. And so I watched my, my two dads get to be good friends. There's a picture I just adore of them sitting and visiting in the living room on a Monday night, and it's just wonderful to think that they're up there doing that, visiting, waiting for us all to come <laughs> join them someday. Um, and I really say my second dad, because I really feel like, you know, that was a lot of years ago, and he was just a wonderful man and exemplified so much for me of what um, I see in my husband. And I was given some wise words one time before I married Mark that if I wanted to see what my husband would be like to just look at his dad. And I have pictures on the refrigerator right now. If you stop at my house, there's a picture of the invitation to the party. And there's a picture of Mark and I. And they were sitting close together. And I looked at those pictures. And I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, it kind of scared me how much he looked like his dad. And I didn't see it, because I've always just looked at him. But um, I'm just so grateful to be uh, the first in-law in the family, because I was, right, Mom? Right? I'm number one, right? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to say that. <laughs> anyway, um, and it was, what a blessing to, to have the longest time. And I also remember when Greg and Diana were getting married, I took Diana aside and say, hey, Diana, if he ever tells you, you know, don't tell secrets at the table, he's kind of kidding. It's okay, you know? <laughs> anyway. 
I sure miss him, and I'm just um, looking forward to the day again when we can celebrate. Kathy, he was not teasing. <laughs> no one in this family teases. And then we can talk about a bridge for sale. So I probably wouldn't be up here except my granddaughter, what's your name? Amelia. Said, you do it, Papa. You want to talk? So Amelia and her sister Natalie are the only twins that I'm aware of in this family. And dad told me that he always wanted twins and he finally got them. And I am thankful to have these twins and my other grandchildren. And I'm thankful for all of you, and I'm very thankful for my father. Love you, Dad. Anybody else? I should have the mic at the other end of the room, apparently. I went for a little longer than mom, so I got here a little faster. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read this because that's easier for me. Um, and similar to Alex, he made a comment about, we all know what a wonderful man Grandpa was, and I feel like I would not do him justice to even talk about that, so I'm just going to tell a couple of stories. <laughs> Um, when I was little, Grandpa used to sing me a song every time I sat on his lap. Um, I don't have it anywhere near the voice that he did, but something to the effect of, Julie Fair, Julie Fair, how I love my Julie Fair. Songs to sing her, trinkets to bring her, and flowers for her golden hair. And until like a year ago, um, I didn't even know that that song didn't say Julie. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just thought it was a song about me. <laughs> um, but I mean, every time I sat on Grandpa's lap as a little girl, he would sing me that song. And uh, you know, that <laughs> when I got a little older, I'd be super embarrassed. I'm like, oh, Grandpa, you sing me the song, like, <laughs> right? But oh my gosh, the treasure that that is now. Um, and I can still hear his voice singing it to me. Um, when I was born, um, my parents had not picked a middle name yet for me. And so Grandpa wrote a letter saying that my name should be Julie Grandpa Brault, um, that, he could, that I could have his name as my middle name, that it could be Grandpa. Um, and my son's middle name actually is Gene, which I didn't know until we named him Michael Gene, that Grandpa's name is actually Eugene Michael. So they have the same name. Um, <laughs> just flipped. But um, my son Michael and Grandpa were good pals. Um, and when we visited Grandpa um, shortly before he passed, Michael walked in and said, hi, pal. And Grandpa responded, yeah, he and I are pals. Um, there's a couple of super adorable little pictures of Michael and Grandpa. Um, yeah, I just feel so blessed to have the grandpa and the grandma that I did. There you go. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, again, from the back of the room. See, I'm at the wrong end. So I figured it was time for another funny story. And it's probably the only way I can do this. So Lynn mentioned in her video that 
I went, joined with them. This was after I was married, and I joined with them to a trip to Florida to go to Disney World. Mom and Dad had asked me if I would go along so that Lynn had somebody to go on the roller coasters with, and it was a great trip. We had a great time, tons of laughs. It was really a cool time for me and Lynn to hang out together. Um, so, but during that trip, you know, strange place, driving a rental car, not sure exactly where we're going. Dad turns the wrong way down a one-way street. And he's fully committed because the light at the other end has kept all the traffic away, so we have no clue. So he turns, and then the light changes, and now there's like four lanes of traffic coming right at us. So the first time I ever heard him say anything besides damn, and he yells, oh, shit. <laughs> and here's all these cars coming, and he drives up onto the sidewalk because there was nowhere else to go. And Lynn and I are in the back seat, and we are cracking up, and we, we don't... We don't realize exactly the danger of the situation, but we are just laughing because, number one, we just heard Dad say something we had never heard him say before, and number two, he just drove on the sidewalk. So now we're on the sidewalk, and we've got to wait, and then he's got to have a chance to get the car turned around and off on the right way, and we're cracking up, and he is, you know, in his stern way, telling us it's not funny, and we're looking at each other like, yeah, it really kind of is. But we tried to be really quiet, and we all survived. It was not a big deal. Um, but I want to end with this. So I am privileged to be in a text message group with some of my wonderful nieces and my daughter. And Carrie Lynn wrote something this morning that I thought is the perfect summation of all of this. She said, I think our family is so big because it just wouldn't have been fair for only a few people to have had grandpa in their lives. We are just the luckiest. That's, that's it in a nutshell. If you were lucky enough to meet him, you were lucky enough. Anybody else? Do you want to talk? Do you want to say something? We love you, Grandpa. Oh, you want to hold him? Well, you have to talk. It's your turn. This is Quinn. Quinn has not had the pleasure of meeting her great grandpa because she was born in August of 2020. But she thought she wanted to talk. Apparently, she wants to play the microphone. And this is her big sister, Paisley. Hi. <laughs> did you love your great grandpa? Uh -huh. <laughs> what did you love most? Um. Um. Did you like when you read the stories? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, really quickly. Uh, in case you haven't noticed, there have been grandchildren, multiple grandchildren, and even my sister who have all mentioned dad talking sternly. You didn't hear one person say that he yelled at them. Dad didn't yell. He could give you a look. He could talk to you in a very low, stern tone. And you knew there was never yelling. It was, he was stern, and you knew when he meant business. But dad never yelled at any of us. Um, and I'm going to tell you one quick funny story. This one has to do with Carrie Lynn and a date she was going to go on. So it just so happens that we were having a family birthday party for one of her siblings. So there were aunts and uncles there, and the grandparents were there, and Carrie Lynn's date arrived. So he came in and was introduced to us. It was the first time that Brian and I were meeting him. And Dad walked over to him, shook his hand, and he said, 
I just want you to know, you better treat her right. She's got 42 feet of uncles. <laughs> and they know where you live. <laughs> Do so I like reading books with Grandpa? Thank you. Anybody else? That's very sweet. I'm not sure anybody can top that. <laughs> All right, well, thank you everybody for coming. There are still spud nuts that need to be eaten. And uh, feel free to hang around and visit. Mom, do you have something else you want? Um, you've, you've already seen back there that we've got display tables with lots of pictures and you see a cathedral. Well, this all came about, I see that. Mike and Shauna gave Jean a puzzle, 3D, 3D puzzle of the Notre Dame Cathedral one year for Christmas. And he, when, after he built it, he got the idea and he said, I am gonna build one. They had never done anything like this in his life. So after many trials of trying to make the stone, he finally got a, a combination that he used and it worked. And he would put this stuff in a cookie sheet and score it and when it was ready, he'd break all the pieces and he had to, to um, smooth them all out so that he could build his cathedral. And that was one big step. Then one day he decided, I want chandeliers. And we were in the mall and it was a time when uh, there were lots of tables set up with people that had made things and they had them for sale. And one was a glass blower. And he had these little um, bird baths. So they were on a little stand in this pretty little round top. And he looked at that and he said, ask the guy, could you make those for me without the stand and put a hole in the middle? I want to turn them upside down and use them for a chandelier. He goes, sure, I can do that. So that, he made those and that became the chandeliers in the cathedral. He, um, struggled with lighting <laughs> and many times it took a lot of years to finish the project because he'd get all his lighting done turn it on and it would blow up and his sister found these tiny little led lights and he put those in and success finally and they stayed on Anyway, he put a lot of work, a lot of love, and it's back there for you to see. And enjoy all the other things. The pirate story is back there, other things he's made and done. And anyway, there's a lot of things about him that you still don't know. <laughs> We've got one more here. Did you have something you want to say? I, I like puppy and I like mommy and daddy. All right, thank you, everybody. Did you have something else? Okay. Um, I got something to tell you. Um, I like reading books with my mommy and daddy. All right.